Um, so yeah, going to talk about LLM ops, which is something that is something I'm really passionate about just now. Uh, but first, just a super quick intro to me, because a lot of you probably yeah, he's got like <laughs> a lot of you probably don't know me. Uh, as Amir mentioned, I'm head of ML Ops at NatWest Group. So NatWest Group are one of the biggest banks in the UK. We've got around, I think, 60,000 people working for us, 19 million customers in the UK. We have people working across the UK, Poland and India. And we have around 500 data scientists and data engineers and ML engineers working on problems for our customers and for our stakeholders. So it's a really exciting place to work. And we sort of we've done a lot of really great stuff over the past years with AWS moving to build out our MLOps platform around SageMaker and the surrounding ecosystem. So there's lots of cool stuff. If you look up look us up online, you'll find that. As Amir mentioned, I'm the author of a book. I've worked in several different uh, industries, several different areas, and I've done everything from being the DS, sort of building the the first linear regression in a company, all the way through to now quite a senior manager holding the reins on the MLOps strategy. So I've, I've, I feel like I've seen a lot, not seen it all, but I've seen a lot. Um, and I've done some other fun stuff. If you want to find out about that and follow me, I often like talking about all this stuff. Just ping me up on LinkedIn, it'd be great to connect. But enough about me, what we're here to talk about, right? So I think from, from Daniel's talk and probably just generally, you, you already know this, right? The current moment is a crazy moment um, where there is so much hype around LLMs, so much hype around foundation models. We've got everything in the news from it's going to solve every problem we've ever had through to it's going to take over the world it's, and it's going to enslave us and everything in between, right? And the, the challenge we now have as technical people working in this space, in organizations, in teams, is that we have to cut through that hype, right? And we have to make these into these ideas into some sort of tangible product that drives value. And I know Daniel would have been talking about that at length, what that value means and how that how that interfaces with lots of different dynamics. But the key thing that we need to think about, I would say, and this is where the ops part comes in, is that building the model is only one step of many that's required, right? So the LLMs that OpenAI, Google, Anthropic, et cetera, et cetera, are building is only one piece of the puzzle if you want to take that new capability and embed it into your organization or embed it into a solution you have to think about lots of surrounding pieces of technology and processes and systems. And talking about systems, a quote that I always use in any talk about MLOps or ops in general is this one from James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits. So he said, you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. So for me, MLOps and LLM ops and the surrounding ops family are all about raising the level of your systems your technical systems, your technology systems, also your processes, your ways of working, how you educate your people, how they, how you organize them as well. So really that's what you're always thinking about. How do you raise the level of your systems? And the way the way you start breaking that down and we start getting into the sort of meat of what I wanna talk about and hopefully discuss when I open things up is that although there's a lot of new stuff coming, there's a lot of foundations we can leverage. So. I often talk to my colleagues about what I call XOPS. So X just standing for Dev, ML, LLM, Data, DevSec, and any combination thereof. I think I saw DevSec Data Ops at one point. Um, the idea is that these families of operational practices and ways of doing things often build on one another. So from DevOps, we had CI CD, we had robust testing practices, we had a lot of other things, infrastructure as code, et cetera. That's then carried over that's into found. that's carried over into ML ops and data ops. And what I'm kind of arguing is that in LLM ops, a lot of those things still stand as well. So I've had a few conversations with people saying, Oh, is, is ML ops dead? Absolutely not. Just like DevOps isn't dead, just like data ops isn't dead. But they are evolving. And what I want to highlight today is the points where I think these practices are evolving and are, are slightly different. Because I think it's it's important for us to think about them. So first setting the scene, I know there's a lot of really technical kind of experts on the call, so a lot of you'll know this, but for those of you who kind of don't, um, and just to set us all on the same level, when you think about machine learning operations, you're thinking about some of these, these processes that you have to do. So you're thinking about how, when I develop a model and I tweak it and change it, I will track the experiments I run, I'll manage the model versions and manage the status of those models. I'll put them through different stages into production eventually. How do I build the artifacts? 
that I have for the models into working pieces of code that I can orchestrate. That's my pipelines. How do I deploy and architect these solutions? How do I orchestrate? And then how do I get into removing toil? That kind of idea from DevOps of removing toil, removing manual labor. How do I automate? And then a, a really important topic is obviously the difference that happens for post-deployment monitoring when you have a machine learning model. So these things are kind of ML ops. And a lot of these are still here for LLM ops. A lot of these are just being adapted or there's slightly different variations, but the, the core is still there, I think. And that's why I've put this bubble of LLM ops inside ML ops. Some people argue it's to the side or it's totally different, but I, I think it's kind of the, the substantial overlap. But what's important for the conversation today is probably where's where's the difference and where do we need to start thinking differently developing new techniques new skills new ways of working so again a lot of you'll probably know this but because it's now generative models we're working with there's what i've called it more non-determinism there's probably a better way to phrase that the sort of the the differences you can get and the responses you have not just between perturbations in your prompts and how you input into the models but also across models across chains of prompts and different workflows is quite substantial so there's there's kind of a there's a need to control in a way that we maybe didn't have with more traditional machine learning models the evaluation and monitoring is a bit different um i'll come on to that in a bit more detail in, in a in a second um the the steps required i think are as a whole far more expensive computationally these the costs of doing these steps will come down However, I remember even a few years ago, you could use the rule of thumb of, of your machine learning, your inference is super cheap and you're only you're really your training is expensive. Even that's sort of quite different now. I can't say that. If I say that to my boss and then they get my open AI uh, API bill, they're not going to believe me again because <laughs> they know it's not cheap. So again, the costs are coming down, but I think if you're, especially if you want to run your own hardware and your own clusters, your own systems for doing work with LLMs and with foundation models more generally, you have to factor in that it's more expensive and there's different techniques at play. Prompt engineering, prompt ops, as I call it. So the whole workflow we have is a bit different now. A lot of it might be similar in terms of building out those pipelines and orchestration, et cetera. But there's really some, some new elements in there that we have to think about in terms of the prompting. And then new deployment patterns. There's a new stack emerging. There's new series of tools and technologies that we have to interface and bring together. We have to think what that looks like. And then finally, a topic I won't cover, but we can maybe chat about in the discussion is uh, security. So the whole attack surface has kind of changed for these models and any customer facing systems using them. So deep diving a little bit, but not, not too much in depth because of the time. Um, there's a lot of ways of evaluating your models, right? And some of them in the, the talks that are coming later today, I know we'll cover these in a lot more depth, but just to give a brief overview, there's there's still the ability to use sort of what I call ground truth metrics. So metrics where there is a reference ground truth data set, so Blue, Rogue, Meteor, there are others. You can still do that with LLMs, but you need to think a bit more about setting up your experiments and, and how that works. And then you get into using benchmarks. So there's a really good set of benchmarks. That's only three. There's way more than that. I just don't have room to list them all. And that's providing a good comparator between different models and different stages of your development life cycle, how are things performing? And you can use that in combination with the ground truth metrics, but also with your own enterprise or use case data. But then you get into some newer ways of thinking, which are maybe more around, I've called the one certain estimation, LLM evaluation of LLMs, so these different ways of working. So there's techniques like self-check GPT, where you perturb a prompt, and then the answer that you get, if you check the similarity of it, the idea is that with small perturbations of prompts, uh, small changes in similarity mean that the LLM is less likely to be hallucinating. So there's things to think about like that. And that's quite different from a traditional ML metric. And in perplexity, you know the, the, the amount of disorder in your answers. And then we get to this new concept of using models to evaluate models. Um, a colleague of mine said, is it LLMs all the way down? Um, so I think that's going to be a really interesting interesting development as well. So on the monitoring side, if we talk about a classic ML sort of monitoring pipeline, you can do distributional shift checks and drift and anomaly detection on either side of this, but I've just shown a kind of cartoon. And it's pretty straightforward. You can check for shifts and drifts, anomalies, and you track the model versions that lead to those. And you can roll back if necessary. And what you can always do is think, 
in my operational process, how do I get the ground truth to check the performance of the model and how do I bring in human evaluation? When we get to LLM ops, things get a bit more complex. So we have to start thinking, you know, I'm not just using my internal models, I'm using third party APIs and other vendors and different ways of hosting. If you're on Amazon, you're using AWS Bedrock or using OpenAI APIs, et cetera. So there's a bit of, bit of complexity there. You need to start viewing, I think, prompt and response is more of a composite object. So you can't just sort of look at one side or the other in isolation. I think you should also be doing things like prompt response tuple similarity drift and other techniques. So starting to think how do those things change as a grouping together? Because that'll tell you a lot about how the LLM is performing. We've got a lot of complexity on the right-hand side in terms of processes. So this is something we're dealing with just now in the bank a lot is what is this process? Where is, where is the human in this? Do we just use LLMs? What does ground truth mean for these applications? We're having to think about that. And then finally, and this applies to prompt and response, but how do you bring in more sophisticated screening and techniques and understanding the things you don't want to appear in your prompts or your responses? And that relates to that security question, which I'm not going into, but how you protect your LLM from attacks. No, I'm not. I'm not going to talk for too much longer. But the the computationally expensive points we mentioned. Um, there's a few different things that I think we should bear in mind as we delve into this new world. So, initial training of LLMs, if you're doing it, if you're brave enough to build your own LLM, is a huge cost. It's very expensive. There's a lot to do there. Even if you're fine tuning a model on your own data, there's a lot of evaluation needed. There's a lot of curating of that data set. There's a lot you have to do. And you have to really think about it now in light of the evidence that models like GPT-4 outperform MedPAM-2. So the main align models maybe not performing as well as a general model. Do you need fine tuning? Storage, storage of the models now is a big footprint. The models themselves are big. So how are you thinking about that? The latency, I think latency is going to be one of the big challenges for, for these models. There are techniques like streaming LLM and stream diffusion, et cetera, uh, on, the, on the imaging side that can help you reduce latency and sort of do things with continuous context windows, et cetera. But we really have to keep innovating in that space in order for applications to work. And all of this costs lots of dollars, lots of pounds uh, where I am, but lots of money, basically. So you need to be really clear what your investment angle is. And here's some tips. So if you're going to train your own LLM, my recommendation to most people is don't do it unless that is literally the USP of your business, like OpenAI, et cetera, or Anthropic. If you are fine tuning, Optimize as far as possible and use a scalable framework like Ray. I'm a big fan of Ray. Another talk I give is all about LLM fine tuning with Ray. If you need to store your models and you want to reduce the footprint, or you maybe even thinking about putting them on smaller devices, uh, quantize, use memoization, use caching. That also helps with latency. But you also have to start thinking about hardware and memory bandwidth optimization, how you're working with your GPU clusters. And then on the cost side, not just open source, but make sure you're looking at all of the, the suite of models that are out there and optimizing for cost, because that is where you're going to be really penalized, I think, in an operational sense. Just coming up, ignore the Slido piece it's from an old presentation. Um, on the infrastructure side, and this is one of the last points I make, we're having to change what skills and what understanding we have in this kind of space now. So most enterprises, I would argue, at least, at least, at least kind of the ones I've worked with, are not used to working with GPUs. We used to have sort of CPU clusters and that would do our job. Now we're in the realm of basically you definitely need mixed GPU, CPU clusters or GPU clusters. And you need to kind of upskill your people to do that and you need to start working with those techniques. So it's no longer the few edge cases where you're deploying deep learning models. Now there's a big appetite for hosting your own models, but also fine tuning, et cetera, like we've been speaking about. And that's quite a big shift for a lot of companies operationally. Second last point, um, prompt engineering. I think we have a lot of work to do here, especially in the organizations I'm seeing, but thinking about how we standardize, how we interact with these models is important. So here's that classic paper from Vanderbilt University looking at some different prompt patterns and just understanding what those look like how we can bring different different inputs from our users and standardize them so that we can get some more controlled behavior in the models. And then on the ops side, how do we you know, control these in a way that we can share maybe a prompt bank 
how do we standardize for specific domains even within large enterprises like mine how do we make sure that you know we have prompts that are optimized for fraud use cases or optimized for other use cases and the last point before we open for discussion is um this new stack that's opening so we've all seen this the a16z emerging llm app stack i quite like this i think there's more that's always being added but the the key point i wanted to draw attention to was that not all of this is new some of it is new so the idea of having a prompt sort of playground and building out your prompt engineering there that's a, that's a new part of the stack the idea of embedding models and vector databases really important for your your rag applications that's quite new so there's a whole new part of the stack where we need to invest in these tools and technologies and upskilling them we all need to understand embedding models and then the idea of interfacing with proprietary apis as almost a standard is, is a slightly new thing i would argue but then we have some pieces of the stack that are just adapted so orchestration we've always had orchestration but now we're using things like langchain lama index etc so there's new tools in there but it's still still orchestration in the purest sense i mentioned some of the stuff around caching logging we need to think about logging or prompts etc and then validation i think we've always validated our models hopefully or we've been doing ml ops very poorly but how we do that is different and trying to something i'm obsessing about just now is how do we see what that landscape is because there's so many tools and packages being released all the time how do we validate these models what do, what do we use what do we apply consistently and then we've always used hugging face over the past few years um everyone's been using the transformers library now now we just have to adapt what we're pulling from there so we're pulling all the latest llms rather than the more classic sort of berts and barts etc and roberta and the last point I'll, I'll say is just wrapping up so the takeaways are in the world of llm ops there's new stacks new techniques new models they're all coming together so we should get abreast of them as soon as possible there's different modes of interaction with the models and a lot of enterprises probably aren't fully appreciative of that there's sort of there's more there's going to be more use cases where you have to have a chat interface or a more dynamic sort of relationship with the model the models can be harder to control because of that generative nature so that has to be factored in when you're running these things operationally if you do want to fine tune or host your own llms or fms for the issue models that may make sense but your investment will be higher so you have to have a really good roi case for it and I think we're still working out what the return on investment is for applications with these models. Um, and then I think personally, although I've I've reviewed this slightly in light of that GPT-4 MedPAM2 result, so that's, that's how fast this is moving. But I think if you have your own domain aligned models, that'll be very beneficial. But I think your ops practices will really help your organization and your teams get a step ahead because this is the big unsolved areas I see it. So there's a huge opportunity to take LLMs and really use them in anger.